Let's honor the Lord. Let's glorify Him. This is His house and this is our third service. We already had two services, awesome services, and praise God that we have now the third. Those of you online as well, so this service is hybrid. So those of you online, for one reason or another, you're not able to come to church. We respect that, but it's still better to come to church. Okay? So it's still better if you can make a way back. Nothing like worshipping God together. Amen? In this atmosphere, there's nothing really being back to church physically. Father, I want to commit this time to you, even as I share this very important topic from your word. Help me to communicate it precisely, concisely, as according to what you would want us to hear. And may we act it out and live it out every day of our lives. So Lord, I need you as I submit myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and this church belongs to you. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. One more small announcement. Next week, we are having a, a caregivers conference, seminar rather, here in Sang 2. Uh, who is it for? It's actually for every one of us. Somewhere along the line, you have to care for your aged parents. Somewhere along the line, some of you are already caring for a loved one who's got cancer. Some of you are already caring for somebody, a loved one who has had a stroke or in rehabilitation or one way or another, he or she cannot care for herself. You care. So how do you care? Very important seminar run by our own SIBKL Medical Fellowship. So you have physicians, geriatricians, nurses, uh, and also a pastor as well who is involved in this caring. So I would encourage you, it's FOC, all right, come next Sunday after church, all right, and believe me, you will be blessed. I want to share with you today a message entitled, How to Handle Wealth Jesus' Way, taking from the incident of the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 18. So let me just read the passage of scripture from Luke chapter 18, Verse 18 to verse 30. A certain ruler asked Jesus, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy. So when Jesus heard this, amazingly, Jesus never contradicted him, meaning he actually did all this. Can you imagine? You go and talk to Jesus. Jesus, I never lie. You know? what, man? Uh, I never bore false witness. Huh? Sure not. But this guy, amazing. But when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you lack one thing. In a Matthew account, preceding this is the phrase, Jesus loved him. Jesus loves all of us. But there are special people like this who stands out and when Jesus loves him, everything that follows is because Jesus loves him. Understand? That's very important you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was very, very sad. Because, and it's a very important statement, he was a man of great wealth. So Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who have heard this then ask, what then? Who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with men 
is possible with God. Now, let me continue and finish to verse 30. Eh? It's not working. Help me. Peter then said, we have left all to follow you. And then Jesus said, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come. Eternal life. Why is it that I focus on wealth? Why? As I read this passage several times, I go back to the story again and I, I'm amazed that this man is extraordinary. This young adult, it has been said in the Mark's account that when he came to Jesus, he came running and he fell and kneeled, you know, with his rich robes overflowing to the knees and the feet, you know, the dusty robe. He fell down. Why? He honors Jesus. He is authentic. When he asks the question, what must I do to inherit? He's genuine. No. This guy is not just trying to test Jesus. He's smart. Clever. He's wealthy. An amazing thing is he's really schooled and tutored in the Torah. And more important than that, he lived it out. I have done all this. And Jesus never contradicted him. You know, these kind of people, uh, every mother would gladly surround, surrender their daughter to him. In Cantonese, he says, <laughs> And But Jesus said, you like one more thing. Why? So that God can bring this man, because Jesus loved him, to another level. But the one thing that prevents him from going to that level was wealth. Now, from this, I asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want me? Not only to teach, but to learn myself. Now, I'm not, Jesus is not asking you to give up everything to feed the poor. It's only specific for this man. But there are certain lessons to learn. How do we handle wealth? Jesus' way. And it applies to everyone, no matter how much you have. I'm going to share it under three broad headings. Number one, Jesus' perspective on wealth. Number two, I want to debunk certain myths and misconceptions about riches. And thirdly, the crux of the whole message today, three above all. Three keys, if you grasp it, it will enable you and I to look at whatever God has given to us in a practical way, in a biblical way, and in a livable, doable way. It's not undoable, understand? So this is where I'm coming from. Number one, what is Jesus' perspective on wealth? Luke 18, verse 22. Jesus says this. He says to the young man, you still lack one thing. Sell everything that you have. Again, I'm saying this. Jesus is not asking everything. Any one of you to do that, don't... Ah, no, for this man. But there are principles. Give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. Here, Jesus contrasts between material possessions and such a thing called treasure in heaven. Now, if Jesus says there is a treasure in heaven... There is a treasure in heaven. In other words, the moment you and I, the moment we become a Christian, that very moment, you have 
a bank account open for you in heaven. In other words, all of us have a bank account open in heaven. The only question is, is it empty or is it full? That's all. Every one of us have bank accounts on earth without exception. Every one of you have got a bank account, maybe in several banks. But we also have a bank account in heaven. The moment you and I become a Christian, that's automatic because that's what the Lord wants to do. The key is, what are we doing with that account? So Jesus says there is a thing called treasures in heaven. And again, he repeats it in, it's not working so well, okay? In Matthew chapter 6, in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures, rather, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust, I don't know why vermin, it could be vermin, no? destroy, in other words, worms, uh, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What is this treasures in heaven? Who, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, this is the crux. Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other, you cannot both serve God and mammon, which is the God of money. This is the only time Jesus identifies a God. All the names are in the Old Testament. Only one. Mammon. The key is, who is your master? Nothing wrong with being wealthy, understand? Nothing wrong. The Lord wants every one of us to do well financially. After all, you know Abraham was very wealthy. Isaac was very wealthy. Jacob was also very wealthy, you know. David was a wealthy king. Solomon, the wisest and, and, and full of wealth. The queen of Sheba came, wow, bring wealth. Wealth in new, cannot count. Job was very wealthy. Did God say, hey, stupid, uh, slap, slap, slap. Why are you so wealthy? Uh? No. No. You know, you, know, you know Peter? He's a very wealthy man. Uh. He, why? he got a fleet of boats. He left the boats and went, and then after that, he went back to the fleet of boats. Why? Peter, James, and John, they're very wealthy. They owned a fleet of boats. So that when they followed Jesus, someone else continued the business of fishing. The Lord, Jesus, and God is not anti-rich. Is not. He wants, on the contrary, every one of us to do well. But the key is this. Does wealth take the place of God in your life? That's the key. That's the key. Help me. Next slide, please. The key is, where is your eternal security? See, Jesus is not asking you and I to sell everything and follow Him. That is not what he wants. His perspective is that we must have a right view of our wealth and lay up treasures in heaven and not allow your material wealth to take the place of God so much so that money now becomes your God. Jesus is not anti rich. The most important thing we must consider is this, that 
The second thing is, Pastor Chu is not anti-rich. Why do I say that? Because several years ago, there was a rumor going on by mischievous people that say, Pastor Chu is anti-rich. I'm not anti-rich. Why? I'm not poor. Believe me, I'm not poor. <laughs> After working for 27 years, uh, in the medical field, I have my own practice, right? And Pastor Lee Chu also practicing for 27 years. I got savings, one, no? <laughs> and you think I'm stupid? I put money in the bank all the time. I got investments, one, no? <laughs> and not only that, we come from families uh, that are okay, one, uh. So I, I'm not poor. I'm not, I know we are rich as many of you. But I'm not anti-rich. So I do not speak this with a tongue in my cheek, uh. I don't, because whatever I say also applies to me. But the key is this. Never allow your faith and your trust in the Lord to be directly proportional. Let me go backwards. All right, I missed a couple of slides which are very important. Go backwards. This is not working lah. Correct. Never allow your eternal security to be directly proportional to your bank surplus so that the more money you have in the bank, the more secure you are, the more good Christian you are, the more faithful you are. Wrong. Never allow your eternal security to be hinged on your material success. The more successful you are material, the more faithful I am to serve. In this reversal, got no time to serve. In fact, God, I don't even come to church anymore. Never allow your eternal security to be directly proportional to your corporate stature. I don't care whether you're a CEO, a COO, or a CFO, or whatever degrees or title you have before you, in the face of God, all of us are oh, oh, oh. <laughs> at the same level playing field. God never looks at you because you are so and so. Lah. Never. So never allow your eternal security to be directly proportional to your bank surplus, to your material success, or to your corporate stature. Very important. Let me go back to the third myth that I want to debunk. Clearly, it's never about money per se. It's about your love, your devotion to money. When money becomes your first love, no matter how much you may disguise it under all the Christian cliches, when I have this deal, I set up a trust fund. You know how many trust funds have been promised and today, how many trust funds are there? Of all the cliches you, have, you, have, you, you make before God, the truth of the matter is money is your God. You are devoted to it. Money is neutral. But the love of money is not neutral. And that's the point. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, for the love of money, it is the root of all evil. Some people, eager for money, leave, have wandered from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And there are many people here that can testify to this. Read it with me. So, come on. Everyone, read 1 Timothy 6, verse 10 with me. Left, right, front, back, up, down, those of you online as well. Okay? Come on, read this with me. Are you okay with you? Read 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 loud. Are you ready? One, two, three. And they pierce themselves with many grief. One more time. Let's read one more time. One, two, three. 
For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many. How sad. And he's talking about Christians. So the key is this. We must have the right perspective to handle our wealth. And this is the crux. There are three above alls in our life that we must grasp and it is doable, understand? So number one, the first above all that I find in this passage that Jesus is trying to teach you and I on how to handle our wealth Jesus' way is that our values must be above all other values of earthly treasures. Now, it's not that we don't value what we own. But your Christian value, your value of the worth of Jesus in your life, we have sung it a short while ago. After a while, I couldn't sing. Can you sing? Are you prepared to give everything? Think. But it is paramount that as a Christian, we learn and grow progressively in our maturity and depth so that more and more of Jesus is now reflected in life. Ma. Remember we sang, more of you, less of me, ma. correct or not? We just sung it. True or not? The only way it is true is when we intentionally tell ourselves as we live out our life that our values in life must be above all other earthly values. And I repeat, Jesus is not asking any one of us to sell all that you have and give to the poor. No, no, not that. But there are certain things in life that are more valuable. Peace, joy, laughter, love, relationships, sleep. All these things are more valuable in life than material possessions. And believe me, God is no man's debtor. No, when I came back from my sabbatical leave, I was away for five weeks, huh? And I was told that the church grew in my absence so that maybe I should go away more <laughs> so the church can grow more. Not true. I, I saw this book on my table, Radiance and Grace. And uh, it's written about my best friends in the VCF, the Varsity Christian Fellowship, Hong Kong and Eng Lee. That's Hong Kong, that's Eng Lee. Hong Kong means Radiance, uh, Hong Kong, and then Grace is my is uh, his wife. Both of them were colleagues with me in the Varsity Christian Fellowship. We served God together. Uh, Hong Kong was the, the 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 chairman or the or the president of, of the Varsity Christian Fellowship when I was a student, medical student, and I was the missionary secretary. So we we served God together with Eng Lee, you know, and and we had a wonderful time as students. And again, after graduation, we went our different way. Hong Kong, uh, you know, was a top student in the economics faculty. He was also the master or the captain of Fifth College, uh, University of Malaya. He plays rugby for, 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 for university. So on that year, he won the best all-rounder for the university, you know. We were so happy, so proud. Wow, Hong Kong, wow, fantastic. He, he, he was in the Bank Nagara uh, scholarship. And then he served in the treasury for several years. He could have gone way on in the corporate sector, no problem. Eh? And Engli, uh, doing physics, first class honours in physics. You know? First class honours in physics at that time. Lah, huh? and, uh, and what a Fulbright scholarship to the US to do PhD. I think with MIT or something like that. Brilliant girl, you know. And yet, they gave it all up. Went to Bible school in Trinity, Deer Lake, College in, uh, in, in Chicago, came back. You know where they went? They said, Wing Chi, we are back. What can we do? I said, hey, come and join me in East Malaysia. So they came 
And when I was in Sabah, they became the principals, gave up full timer, the principal of Miri Bible College for several years. They could have gone on so well in life. Why? Their values. Their values. You know, I remembered visiting them one, one year when they invited me to speak at the graduation of the student. Josh Pandong was at the time graduating. And I went. And I remembered that night when we had dinner, he, he, they have three children, all grown up already. By that time, they were still small. And we had dinner, and the, the, the two or three vegetables uh, 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 dish. And it was only one dish of four chicken wings. And then I remembered very clearly Ang Lee saying to the children, you see, children, uh, you're so happy, right? Whenever there's a visitor, mommy cooks special for you all, you know. Four chicken wings. And then Hong Kong and Ang Lee gave me two. But I know that. You know, Hong Kong left, gone home with the Lord at 53 years old with cancer of the stomach. And Ing Lee was called home in 2014. And I know when I read this book, I could almost sense Hong Kong and Ing Lee cheering me from heaven. Come on, Wing Chi! Come on! You've done well. I'm so proud of you, Wing Chi. I'm so proud of you. And when I meet them in the heaven, there's so much to share, you know. And my point is this. Love God. Love God, man. Nobody is asking you to give up everything. But your values must be above the values of earthly treasure. Who is your master? The second above all is not, not only your values must be above earthly treasures, but your faith must be above all doubts about the goodness of God. Very important. Why? You think life is so it's a bit of roses. Huh? You know, my, my, my in-law will tell you that business is hard, man. All of you will tell me. Nowadays, with all the uncertainty, business is hard. And you begin to doubt. Nothing, I will say nothing wrong with doubt. It is inevitable. We are humans. Are you sure or not, God? I, I serve you so well. I give you so hard. Why is it that I am still not materially sufficient? We're still, why is it that so-and-so is sick? No, Pastor Did you talked about faith last night in the first service on prevailing prayer. Jesus, in the preceding verses, when he talked about that woman who came to the unjust judge to knock, 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 asking for a favour, after telling the story, Jesus then asked this pertinent question. He says in Luke 18, verse uh, 8, However, when the Son of Man comes to the earth again, will he find faith or not? Will he find faith in the church? The key is, do you have faith? How much faith? Mustard seed faith. That's all that is needed. You cannot relegate and abrogate all your faith when things don't go right. Many of them do. They blame God. They don't come to church. Why? Because they equate their faith with their bank surplus material success, and corporate stature. No! So one thing was blocking this young man from Jesus. Jesus knew it, loved him. You lack one thing. No, the key is this. We must continue to have faith in a good God. There are three unshakable tenets of our faith. 
Number one, God is good. Number two, God is in control. And for Pastor Lee Chu who said yesterday, God knows what she, he is doing. For me, I will say God cares. These are the three unshakable tenets of your faith no matter what you're going through today. God is a good God. God is in control of your life. He knows what He is doing. And very important, He cares for you. Come on, say this with me. Come on, is it okay? Say this with me, come on. What are the three unshakable convictions that must anchor our faith, come what may? Everybody say, number one. Number two. Number three. Say it one more time. What are the three unshakable convictions that come what may is unshakable? Number one. Number two. And number three. He cares for you, man. He cares for you. He has not abandoned you. And He knows what He is doing. Your faith cannot be diminished. No matter what you're going through today. He is a good God. You know the case in point. Come back to the rich young ruler. Stumps me is this. Why is it uh, that Jesus asked him, give everything to the poor and follow me? Why, hey Lord, I said, why not give 10% to Kupla? You know, if the billionaire, 10 billion, 100 million, no. Hey God, maybe 50%. La. Praise God, I give everything. Why? Uh, why? Why, Lord, why? And the Lord said to me this, he said, son, Hear me well. When I asked this rich young ruler to do this, do you not remember that I love him? And therefore, when I ask him to do this, do you think that I would abandon him and shortchange him, punish him, demand from you? No. I didn't see that Jesus says, you give everything immediately, now, now. Look, this guy if he had said yes to Jesus, would have gone back to manage his affairs, settle everything and then follow Jesus. Ma. If I put this in the modern parlance, in the modern setup, it probably makes a little bit more sense. This guy, if he had said yes to Jesus, would have gone back, probably set up a foundation. Rich man, call himself the Rich Young Ruler Foundation. And maybe uh, 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 give scholarships to the poor. You know how many poor people there are who are bright, who have no money to go to university? He would probably have given money to, to build public schools, more schools for the poor in the rural areas, more public hospitals to see the sick so that they, they can have good healthcare, FOC, got the, get the best consultant to treat them. Don't you think so? The poor deserves good medical care as well. Maybe, maybe to feed the poor who are hungry. Maybe to, 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 to pay pastor salaries in the unrich people group so that the gospel can go far and wide. Maybe, maybe even set up a, a, a foundation for research. You know, all of these things he could do with his money. And do you think Jesus would have shortchanged him? No. Every single cent he invests will bear fruit. Why? Why? Because he gives it to the Lord, he would have made his money more fruitful and productive than he would have given today. You know how many of you have lost millions because you invested in the stupid stock market? <laughs> they crash when the credit suites crash. And many people have told me, if only I had given this to God, hey, this is not your first time, tenth time you've been doing that, you know. <laughs> how many millions you have lost because you invested wrongly. Here, yeah. God says, you invest in me. I make sure your money counts. Rahat Bonke says this. He says, when you give to God, God now becomes your business partner. And when God becomes your business partner, He'll make sure that the business investment grows. Do you think so? He's your business partner, ma? 
so important. That we have no doubt that God is a good God and He means the best for you and I. The third above all is the most difficult. So, number one, how do we handle our wealth? Number one, your values in life must be above the value of our possession. Now, it's not, I'm not saying it's unimportant. It's very important. But you cannot sell your Christian integrity. You cannot trade your faith. You know, that's what happened to, to, the, to, the, to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. When, when, the, when after worshipping with, with Melchizedek, having communion, we had communion just now, right? Exactly the same. When, when Abraham had communion with, with, with Melchizedek, in Genesis, no, bread and wine. Because Melchizedek is a type of Jesus. Man. As a king of Salem, he came out of it and who he met? The king of Sodom. It's the world. It represents the world view. It represents the spirit of the world. And what happens to the king of Sodom? You go and read it. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, you give me the souls of the men. I give you money. But Abraham says, no. I've just taken communion. I have lifted my hand to the God Most High, El Elyon, that I will not tread a single thing with you. What about you? How much are you worth that you trade your soul for things that do not matter? Number three, your relationship with Jesus must be above all other earthly relationships, even with your loved ones. Wow. And I share with you a short while. It is doable. Jesus says this. Look at them. In other words, the disciples asked Jesus. And Jesus said this, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible with God. Then Peter said, we have left everything to follow you. And Jesus then answered, no man who has left home or brothers or sisters is the Mark account. Eh? Same thing for, for, for Luke. The Mark account is better. Matthew, or father, mother, children or fields for me and the gospel's sake will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, brothers, children, fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. God will never, never, never shortchange you. Now, let me come back to relationships. It is the paradox of the first love. And what it said is this. It's never about loving Jesus less. When you love Jesus most, and He is your first love, it is when you love Jesus most, you begin to love others even more. It's the paradox of the first love. When you put Jesus first above everything else, do you think the Lord will shortchange you? After all, He has commanded us to love and honour our father and our mother. He, will He contradict Himself? No. But the fact is this. When you love the Lord more, you will love your parents even more. You will love your family even more. Believe me, you will love your wife even more. Pastor Lee Chiu and I have this tacit agreement, un unwritten agreement, that when I see her honour the Lord, serve God, give everything she has, all her gifts and talents, including getting a musical next year, and doing it for the glory of God, it encourages me. I don't complain. And the same for her. When she sees me giving my best shot for Jesus, at the end of the day, we love each other more. We love our children more. It's a paradox of the first love. That's why 
In the Ephesian church, he says, you have lost your first love. Paramount. When we love Jesus most, we love others even more. Listen to me. God is no man's debtor. Everybody say this after me. God is no man's debtor. Now can I have the musicians on stage? Never doubt God. He's a good God, understand? He will never shortchange you. In other words, far above everything that we see in life, Jesus must be above all. When we put him first in our lives, he now is in control of our lives, not us. We have already made so much of a mess of our lives. Do you think the Lord will allow us to, when he takes over, to make a mess of us? No. He is in control, he is good, and he cares. And he knows what he's doing. So the key is this, as I close. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You know, one of the products of us doing the Luke series is that remember in February when I did the overview, I want to bring the church back to a Christocentric focus. Focus back on Jesus as the center of it all. You do that, church. You do that. Why? Because in Him, all things were created, things in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. Now, you read with me this one. All of you read this. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Teenage. Come, you read with me. Are you ready? All of you, left and right, front to back, those of you online as well. Are you ready? One, two, three. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in He must have the supremacy. When you put Jesus above all, you will never be shortchanged. Understand? Ephesians says this, I pray and I pray with you, all of you, also that in the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you. It is the riches of His glorious inheritance, treasures in heaven. You let your eyes be upon the eternal, understand? This life, 70, 80 years will go. You don't carry a single cent with you. And all you need is six feet by six feet, six feet real estate property, that's all. That's all. But honor the Lord. The riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints is incomparably great power for us who believe. The power is like the working of His mighty strength. Next slide. Which He exerted in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him in His right hand in the heavenly realm. This is the glorious Jesus. The, the Jesus who was enthroned far above all rule and authority, power, dominion, every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the age to come. This is to me, my friend. Honour the Lord. Live it out, your Christian faith, so that all your values are above earthly treasures. Your faith is above all doubts. He's a good God. And you connect with Him above all relationships. When you love Jesus most, you love others even more. Let me close. Alexander the Great, true story, has conquered most of the known world during his time. At 33 years old, he has conquered most of Europe, Egypt, Middle East, and went on to Asia. But he died at 
an age of 33 years old. Nothing much to conquer already, ma. Power, wealth, fame, name it, lah. Everything that he has. He checked out the Google. He had three last wishes before he died. And one of them is this. One of his wishes is this. He says, when my casket is being carried to the grave, leave my hands hanging outside the casket. For empty-handed I came to this world. Empty-handed I shall go. Wealth, plenty. Power, unlimited. But he says, empty-handed I came to the world. Empty-handed I go. Love God. Whatever resources and time, talents that God has given to you, don't waste it away. Don't talk rubbish and give empty promises that you will know you will never keep. No. Live a life that honors the Lord, understand? Honors the Lord because He is worthy. Just close your eyes, bow your heads with me. You know, these sort of messages, huh? not, not every church can preach on now. But it is okay for us in SIBKL because we want to love the Lord even more. Am I right? I, I don't want to preach a prosperity gospel to you. But I know that when we obey principles in the Bible, God will never shortchange us. Remember, He is no man's debtor. So in the closing moments of this morning, I would alter, issue two altar calls. Number one is generic. In other words, it applies to everybody. Number two is specific. The generic call is this. All heads bowed, all eyes closed. If any one of you would love now to say, Pastor, I have indeed be unwise in the management of my wealth, my possessions, my funds. But today, I want to ask God for wisdom. I'm not asking you to give everything to God, no. Ask God for wisdom to manage it His way. So that from now onwards, you do it the Jesus way, not your way. Why? Because now, when you humble yourself and surrender whatever that you have, no matter how much, I'm not asking you to give it to God. I repeat a thousand times. But you're willing to surrender now to the Lord for Him to manage for you. And if God is now your fund manager because you now trust Him, it will turn out well. One. So all heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you want to do that, you stand up. Let me pray for you. By standing up, you say, Pastor, I'm willing now to surrender Whatever that I have to God, believing that He will now help me manage my funds, help me, give me wisdom, courage even, so that whatever that I have will be productive for His glory. Are you prepared to do that? If you ask, stand up. If not, don't stand. So those of you who are willing to seek God's wisdom over the mess that you have made, the unwise decisions that you have made so far. Unless you're prepared to carry on, by all means, please do that. But if not, I see people standing up. I'm going to wait a short while more. I'm going to pray for you. That God will now give you the wisdom to manage your wealth well. I'm not saying that overnight you become a millionaire. I'm not saying that. But because you surrender your wealth, whatever you have to God. From this day onwards, God takes over. Understand? God takes over. Remember, He's in control. 
is good. He knows what he's doing, and he cares. Do you believe that? So, Father, in Jesus' name, I I want to commit all these people that are standing in your presence, both here as well as upstairs, as well as on. If you are online, uh, you, you do the same. When you either you stand or you raise your hands, uh, to God, it's not important that I see. What's important is God sees. By standing up, you say, Jesus, I want to surrender my funds, my finances to you. You take over and give me the wisdom and the courage to now to manage it your way, so that it is pure and not corrupted and not and not wasted, uh, squandered away. But you help me, God. So I pray for strength. Wisdom to come on every one of these people with individual circumstances, no matter what you know what, what they are. But Lord, you help them now, whether it be for their family, their children, their businesses, whatever it is. Bless them, strengthen them, give them revelation, things they have never seen before, but now they see. Because now you are their business partner. Wow. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Shandara kata da 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 pandai. In a short while, I'm going to give a specific call for everyone, anyone who has got specific problems. Right? You keep standing so that the rest can join you in a short while. Specific problems. A project, maybe. A hiccup. You are at the cul de sac a dead end, something financially in your business, in your home that you you cannot resolve for months now, whether it be your family, your business or or whatever it is. But today, I'm going to open the altar call by faith. You come and ask God for a breakthrough, understand? You ask God for a breakthrough. See, there are four movements as far as I'm concerned. You ask God to break in when God breaks in, you're now able to break with. You break with something. You break from something. You, because God breaks into your life, you're now able to discern ma, so that all the things that are not of God, you're able to break with or break from so that you can break through in order for you to break forth. The fourth one is missional. You cannot give and serve if you don't have enough. So you ask God to break in so that you can break from in order to break through so that you can break forth into a new lease of life for yourself. Understand? So the altar is open. Any one of you who is in the cul de sac, you invite God to break in. Understand? So that he can, you can break from, break through and then you break forth. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Spend a moment of quietness before I close. Will you do that, every one of you? Look to the Lord. You know, before this incident in Luke 18, in Luke chapter 12, there was a man, not wrong, who did very well in his business. He looked around, he says, I want to build bigger barns so that I can improve my storage, more houses, more barns. Nothing wrong with that. But his eyes was never on God, you see. Money became his God. And Jesus said, you fool. You fool. Today, your life will be demanded of you. And what will happen to the things that you have prepared for yourself? Nothing. No value. And the Lord said this. This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. Are you rich towards God? Live for God, understand? And mean what you say. And say what you mean. You will never be shortchanged. 
So in a moment, the choir needs before I close while ministry goes to the front. Will you do that? Those of you in the balcony as well. Just spend a moment of quietness. I know time is running. Just give me a couple of minutes more. Will you do that, please? Every one of you, will you reflect upon what has been shared? Internalize it. So when you go back, while well, Pastor Chu's voice has faded and the musicians have, have gone back, the voice of Jesus is still speaking to you lovingly, encouraging you to do what is right and righteous so that you will do well, so that He can set you up to win. Not to lose. So every one of you, just spend a minute or two before I close. Close your eyes if you have to. If you have to rededicate your life back again to God, do it, my friend. Do it now. Tell God that you love Him. That He is your first love. And ask Him to forgive you because so many things have come in and He is no more your first love today. Make Jesus once again your first love. The paradox of the first love, remember. When you love Jesus most, everything will fall into place. Love God. Put Him your first love. Wow. There's a tremendous presence of God. You know that? Awesome presence of God. And it's a wonderful, wonderful, comforting, assuring, and affirming presence not a condemning one, understand? No. Because God loves us and wants the best for every one of us. And so, Father, we thank you for the word that has gone forth this weekend. How we need to prevail in prayer. No matter what is going through, how much injustice they are, but when we pray, if the unjust judge can answer prayers, how much more will a just God answer our prayers when we pray, when we pray. And today, we want to pray that even as we leave this place, can we have a, now a biblical, proper perspective of whatever we have? Believing God, you will never, never shortchange us because you are no man's debtor no man's debtor you are a good God you are in control you care and you know what you are doing so Father we surrender our lives to you once again we love you Lord we love you we love you with all our heart we love you with all our strengths we love you with all our mind upon this hangs the law of the prophets and so the Lord bless you and keep you this day the Lord make his face always to shine upon you and be gracious to you the Lord turn his face towards every one of you and your loved ones and may he always give you his shalom in Jesus name I pray not because people say Amen let's give God a good clap of offering shall we do that God bless you have a wonderful week. If any one of you wants further ministry, please don't feel uh, fearful anyway to come to the front. The pastors will be here to pray for you and to bless you. God bless you.